and to a public audience of internet enthusiasts. We think you'll agree with us, once you've heard these project ideas, that these are all very deserving projects. Finally, please indulge me for a few moments while I introduce our panel of judges, and then I'll vacate the floor for the presentations you're here to listen to instead of me. Our moderating judge is Freedom House Program Director for Internet Freedom, Danilo Bakovic. He's the, <laughs> you can consider him the Simon Cowell of Internet Freedom. Danilo is from Serbia and he knows firsthand about successful activism. Next, we have Nigat Dad from Pakistan, who, <laughs> so Nigat is on a mission to get YouTube unblocked after more than four weeks without videos of cute cats. She's also recently launched a new NGO for freedom of expression online. Last but not least, we have Khalid Kuba, who you can find in Tunis. <laughs> and he's doing what Google public policy managers do. <laughs> Thank you all, judges, for generously lending us your time and expertise. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first contestant. This is Łukasz Grajewski. He's from Poland, and he's representing the Common Europe Foundation. Can everybody listen? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what about the start? Can can I can I start now? Welcome everybody. This is a presentation of uh, Build a Democracy, Plain and Learn Action. My name is Łukasz Grajewski, and I am a representative of Common Europe Foundation. This is, this is quite young initiative organization from Poland, uh, based uh, two years ago. We we work. We work mostly with the with the Eastern Europe, so our main aim is to strengthening the connections between Poland, European Union, and and Eastern Eastern Europe. Uh, our main project now it's, uh, is uh, is Book.eu. Uh, what about the sound? Can is it from this room? Oh, okay, I will continue anyway. Uh, so isbook.eu is a platform uh, for bloggers from Eastern Europe and uh, for people uh, interested in the in the Eastern Europe. More than 70 authors now, more than uh, uh, four language versions. Uh, so so it's really really big uh, initiative uh, talking about the freedom of speech in uh, Eastern Europe region. Uh, we have also a contest, so we are al almost as good as Freedom House because our contest ngomap.eu is about the best local initiatives in the Eastern Partnership countries. I am showing you uh, uh, those screens to, to, to underline that we use uh, internet, we use uh, new media, we use uh, uh, social networks in our actions so we know how to do this. Uh, but uh, for us, internet is uh, is about people. So 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 we try to focus on people to people contact. So few examples. This is a meeting of NGO map contest uh, winners in Warsaw. Uh, it was uh, a month ago. Uh, here we have uh, some uh, some photo from the youth exchange. Polish and Ukrainian students in uh, uh, meeting in Crimea in Ukraine. It was in uh, September. Uh, a lot of conferences, debates uh, organized in uh, in 2000, uh, 2012. So, what is really important? This is our uh, uh, team of. Uh, this is our organization. We are all friends from university with the same goals, with the same uh, ideas. Uh, we are idealists, I think, still. But we are uh, about how how we can improve uh, uh, relations between people from other countries don't looking on history more looking into the future and about what we can change uh, here is the cloud of uh, I, I, I of hashtags uh, so please take a look uh, hashtags describes uh, what common europe foundation is about so please take uh, take a few seconds to to to, to take a look Going back to the topic, uh, in a m in a March we 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 uh, we 
had a build democracy not regime campaign it was spontaneously made it was w made uh, with uh, our group of friends without any money uh, without any funding uh, without not going uh, t into details because I don't have a time it was about uh, lack of uh, common policy within the European Union countries uh, towards Belarus so we had we prepared a game it looks like Lukashenko Alexander Lukashenko looks like uh, from Mario Bros game and it was uh, small puzzles to m to build democracy uh, and after and after a game uh, you had uh, you have uh, information about the campaign uh, some uh, some movies uh, films with uh, public figures like here is Jerzy Buzek former president of European European Parliament other politicians journalists talking about freedom uh, in, Bela in in Belarus so we uh, we had also petition uh, uh, via change.org and option to tweet to your politician uh, within European uh, Union so it was the main very spontaneous uh, idea and when we when we when we get no uh, when we read uh, information about the possibility of freedom house we we thought that we can somehow continue the the the, the, um, the idea of our campaign so our what i would like to present uh, for uh, to you is a built e democracy it will be continuation of the form of the campaign because it will be still games uh, uh, small small online games uh, flash games uh, based on the ideas from the really old classics like you can see mario bros pac-man donkey kong arkanoid so so it's because we all uh, in the in a team of of creators of this campaign we all love uh, old games uh, but uh, this is only about form about about uh, about the problem which we want to find a solution it's uh, it's it's about treats uh, to internet freedom so maybe you know this uh, quote from some of the united nations document everyone everywhere should have the opportunity to participate and no one should be excluded from the benefits of the information society offers and i think we are all uh, here some some kind of experts in the field of treats to internet freedom so i will not describe how many how many problems we have with internet freedoms we just we just uh, received uh, books about azerbaijan about bloggers in jail so uh, and what i see that uh, situation is not going better is going worse uh, that's why we we have chosen five uh, main uh, treats for us, uh, the b uh, very big problem is internet censorship, putting, uh, putting bloggers in a jail, bad law, bribing bloggers, no access to the internet. So the idea of our campaign will be to produce game and uh, every, every, um, every topic will be another level of a game. Uh, and after, after a short game, it will be, it will be uh, we will provide information about specific cases in specific countries and we will make a proposals of little, uh, little um, little uh, steps, uh, steps, uh, advocacy steps. So uh, to to sign uh, to sign uh, to sign a petition to get in touch with some watchdog organizations, organization, etc. Um, about main aim uh, to raise a level of knowledge of young people about treats to internet freedom to make them more reflective about those treats and usage of internet. Why young people? Because uh, we in the orga our organizations we are quite young still, so we understand young people. I think we know how to how to work with young people, and we we want to work with young people. Uh, it's very important uh, uh, to make uh, people more reflective because I think that in our in our societies uh, which are going still still more more about consumption about buying things not thinking about what we are and what we are doing uh, it's very important to uh, to people from different parts of globes uh, and, uh, when the when the situ uh, where the situation is maybe good with internet to uh, to provide them internet uh, about uh, to provide the informations about the problems global problems uh, problems with internet yes uh, this game will be will be translated in in a, in a, in a many in a many languages uh, so um, the first uh, the first step it will be uh, to make uh, this online game it will be it will be on uh, it, it will be on uh, website builddemocracy.org uh, but it's only beginning of the work. This is what we call uh, uh, school program because what we want to do after after uh, after producing a game, we would like to get in touch with many activists, uh, watchdog organizations, so on uh, uh, around the world. 
because uh, through the organizations, through the activists, we can we can uh, we can uh, have a contact to the uh, schools, uh, to the teachers, and. And uh, on the uh, on the end to reach our uh, our audience, our our um, pupils, students, young internet users. It's not very uh, detailed uh, described, but uh, for, for me, uh, uh, the the age of the the age of the of our audience of the campaign is like people more than 14 y years old. It will be it will be uh, made to be understandable for people uh, up to uh, up to 14. Uh, and to show to you that we are kind of professionals, I would like to say why Build a Democracy campaign will be smart. It will be simple because it will be on browser, the game will be easy, the rules will be easy, and the information uh, provided will be uh, understandable for, uh, for, for, for uh, not, not only for the experts, it, it will be for everyone some kind interested to, to, to getting to know about uh, new things. Me measurable. It's a. Uh, uh, it's a. Um, we we thought that we will map. We will map the schools, which we will be engaged in our campaign, and we'll make uh, some kind of uh, rank uh, ranking of the schools. So first uh, rank, uh, the lowest one will be if we if they will uh, they will confirm that they will in inform uh, uh, pupils about the uh, the our ca campaign. It will be the first step. If they will, uh, if they will make the, uh, if they will help with the survey which we will uh, produce, uh, it will be another step. So on. I'm, I'm going lack of time. Achievable, yes, because we have team ready to make it relevant. I think it's really relevant to make it timely defined. We will make all of those a actions till the, till the uh, end uh, of uh, June 2013. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lukas. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. No, I'm okay. Um, I would like to hear um, how you're going to get those young people. You told us the age, the group. You mentioned schools. How you're going to get them to play your game and why your game? Okay. So uh, w what I would start now here in uh, IGF. It's to get in touch with uh, with different uh, with different activists uh, from different parts of the globe. So it's a it's a it's a job which I will start now to uh, to have a contact in different countries. When we when we uh, will have uh, let's say uh, edu educational kit uh, about uh, about uh, our our campaign. So uh, so uh, some kind of pack of information which will be uh, which will be something added to the uh, to the game we will we will have those contacts uh, to uh, uh, to get in touch with the schools uh, in different parts of uh, in different part of uh, globe w because we will have uh, the game will be translated it's still we still have a, uh, we still have a discussion in our team to which languages we gonna we we will we should uh, translate our game it will be a discussion which i would like to ask you about because it's really important. For example, I don't have a knowledge uh, uh, how to do how to solve uh, a language problem in Africa. So I will ask my friends from Africa to make it to make it prosperous also in a in a part of the uh, world which uh, we which we don't know. Uh, why s why schools and why uh, why our game? Uh, I'm saying like how you will make me to play your game. To you, I will uh, contact you directly. <laughs> Can you repeat, sorry? Uh, uh, about you, I will contact you directly when it will be finished. Uh, my game taste is very picky. Um, OK, thank you. Um, my next question was about languages, and, and you already answered. Um, I would like to ask you just one more question. Uh, what do you think is the key ingredient for that game to be a success, um, and that whole educational effort behind the game to be a success? By your, you know, what do you think it's, it's the key ingredient uh, to make it a success? It's about what I said in the presentation. It's about um, make people more reflective. I don't. Uh, I cannot say. Uh, it's hard about uh, about uh, raising awareness campaign. It's uh, it's hard to say about about uh, a concrete, really concrete goals. 
but what I think about uh, those kind of format of mm, campaign that we can start from a game, we can start uh, of, uh, uh, of contact the schools, and then having a databases of the schools, we can somehow try to make uh, workshops for the pupils, try to make some e-learning for the pupils, so it's the long-term long format, uh, it's, really, it's really easy to, 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 to continue. Thank you, Lukas, thank you very much. Let's give applause to Lukas. Now, who is going to present now? Oh. Gigi. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lukash. Next up, we're going to have Kelly Daniel from Uganda. And Kelly is a programs assistant with the Civil Society Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law. Please come up. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chigonya Daniel from Uganda. I'm going to present Internet Freedom, Your Right, My Right project on behalf of the Civil Society Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law. A uh, brief about the coalition. The coalition was formed in 2009 following the tabling of the anti-homosexuality anti bill which proposes killing of aggravated homosexuals. Uh, aggravated homosexuals are people who sleep with minors, with a lame person, or if you have HIV and you slept with me, then your penalty is death. And if we are two concerning adults, we go for life in we we have to serve a sentence uh, in prison, uh, a life sentence. So the coalition was formed to fight against anti homosexuality bill. But earlier this year, our money shifted from the looking at the bill as a standalone to also look on, uh, on other inhuman laws or bills in parliament and all in other situation. Thus we are doing more advocacy around human rights now. Uh, introduction. In Uganda, the Zibian gay, bisexual, transgenders, intersex, and sex workers communities face a very big digital security problem. This problem comes as a result of the fact that we are targeted as scapegoats by many in our society. Politicians are using us as scapegoats to fulfill their ambitions. Church leaders and many people who are anti gay in Uganda are using the homosexuality as a platform to get where they want. And our government is not doing much because they are the key people who are leading the group which is seeing our documents. And this they do through hacking in our databases. Uh, uh, just like of recent, uh, they act in our database and they got hold of uh, a document we've been using in our work. And now they're using this document to say that whichever organization was present in this meeting, we are going to shut it down for promoting homosexuality. And then we don't have any other space to freely associate. We have to do this online. Because government has shut down meetings, gay meetings, you can't hold a gay meeting in Uganda. A case in Sade is a recent closure of the capacity building workshop, which was organized by Eastern Union of Africa uh, Human Rights Defenders Project at a Sada Hotel. The Minister of Ethics, Father Francis Simon Rokodo, shut it down claiming that we are promoting homosexuality, but this was a, a, a capacity building workshop. So following all this, we ad adopted having our meetings online, which is also proving to be insecure, because now they can uh, act into our database and get our information. Um, and another problem is that <coughs> act into our database uh, in Uganda, we are lucky but not lucky. Most uh, LGBT and sex workers at least own a cell phone. But now these cell phones are also proving to be insecure because the government has decreed that all mobile re users register their SIM cards. And this means if the cards are registered, uh, the, it will be very easy for the government to track down who actually yeah, is an homosexual, who is not an homosexual. Because, for example, if I'm an homosexual, the, uh, the fact that I am, and I called maybe someone and wanted to, uh, to walk up, it will be very easy for the government to just trap, trap us down before even we could you know, get in touch. Uh, 
Freedom of uh, information is a fundamental human right and, and the touchstone of all the freedoms which the United Nations is concentrated. This was the very first uh, resolution uh, that the United Nations adopted before it adopted any resolution or any article. It adopted resolution 59, Article 1, stating that freedom of information is a fundamental human right and a touchstone of all the freedoms which the United Nations is concentrated. And just like the UN, we at the coalition also believe that freedom of expression, information, association is a fundamental human right. But if we can't do it offline, now we have to do it online. That's why we are proposing the Internet Freedom Right by Right project, which is going to be a six months project of the LGBTs get uh, digital security trainings. The project is going to be managed, and these are, goin are going to be the facilitators. Anyanz Mathias, uh, Chigonya Daniel, that is me, uh, Wokuri Junik Anets. Nyanz Masters is the ma uh, has a Master's of Science in Internet inter in Information Systems Technology with an option in it with an option in Technology. As a Master's in uh, Information Systems, with an option is in Information Technology. Nyanz Masters is a bisexual man. He has worked with the coalition on several projects. Uh, he has uh, he was one of the people who led a digital training with the coalition and also other key organizations like the Refugee Law Project and other, other key organizations in Uganda. Uh, I, my, I, myself, Chigonya Daniel, uh, I have a, a bachelor's uh, in I business my, administration with option in management, uh, and I, I also a, did digital yeah, security trainings with the Freedom I House while in Nairobi, uh, and I also did digital security training with the Eastern One of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. And I also did a digital security training with the Eastern One of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. And I also did a digital security training with the Eastern One of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. And I also did a digital security training with the Eastern One of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. And I also did a digital security training with the Eastern One of Africa Human Rights Defenders Project. Uh, Wakuri unique Annet, a professional doctor. Wakuri also did trainings uh, in Wakuri digital security with the Eastern One of Africa. Doctor. Did another training. Uh, did trainings uh, in digital Wakuri security with the Eastern One of Africa. Did another training. Our uh, Kuri Unique Annet is a professional doctor. She did uh, trainings in digital security uh, with the Eastern Union of Africa and also with the Social Security Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law. Uh, Junique uh, does activism with a passion. She's a Zimbian woman and she's an executive director, new executive director of Freedom and Rome Uganda, a Zimbian lead organization. Uh, we believe that with the expertise the three uh, persons have, our Internet Freedom team will be a very, very big team to conduct this training. Uh, training content. What we are proposing is simple yet very effective and useful. A digital security training in the best tru tools that sexual minorities use to need to protect themselves against data storage, against hacking, against eavesdropping. We are proposing a digital security basics training on day one where we shall discuss a person in security and got their data either on mobile, on a computer, or in a crowd. We shall discuss how an individual can be secure while on using chat, chat rooms or voice over internet protocols. Uh, we, we are proposing email encryption using Thunderbird. Uh, we, uh, because government is acting in our email introductions, we have an option. We are going to start having our emails encrypted. So if we train a very large number of people as the project is proposing, we guarantee that our emails will be encrypted. A true crypt, where someone can create a, an invisible disk on their computers and store their sensitive files. Uh, we had a, 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 a case scenario in Uganda this year again. A campus liberty's offices were raided. Campus liberty is a gay organization. They are raided and their information was taken from their computers. And then this information was used in a local daily called Kamunye, 
where they said campus liberty is promoting homosexuality in universities, which wasn't good. They get your information, they exaggerate it. But with through crypto in place, we hope that uh, people will be able to store the information safely where government cannot get all of it. A chat and voice over inf internet protocol encryption, just as I mentioned earlier, we are doing meetings online. And these meetings are based done in chat rooms, which are also proving to be insecure. So we want to provide an alternative chat rooms like CryptoCut, GTs, where, which are encrypted, where we can hold our secure uh, meetings online. Uh, we want to discuss how someone can recover from uh, sensitive info using Recover. Many of the times we are forced to delete our files and also empty our uh, recycle bins. This is not because we just want to delete. This is because uh, someone may trade your office and the best option is to delete everything instantly before they can start taking your laptop. So we, are propo uh, we, are, we want also to cover uh, how someone can recover from that information loss which uh, they do abruptly without you know, their, you know, their wish. We also want to discover the Malta's uh, online documentation software. We still have a problem as a gay movement and sexual workers movement in, in Uganda of documentation. Most of the versions happening to us are not documented. So we are proposing also to teach the Malta software to start documenting what is happening to us and to give the world the real, real truth of what is happening way back in Uganda. Uh, we want to discover how someone can destroy sensitive info using ELASA. Uh, we've, uh, just, uh, before, I, before I went to Freedom House training in Nairobi, I thought that if you did your file, it would be okay. I was thought about Recover. So if we have Recover in place, then you have to have a counter software, which is ELASA, where we, you can permanently ELASA a file from your computer that is proving to be insecure or that you don't need anymore. We're also going to, discu to discuss that. Uh, mobile security based practices and anonymous browsing. Uh, do we have uh, the training is very unique in a way that is a domino effect training. The student becomes a teacher and a teacher falls up on a daily basis. This is very possible because we are going to reach participants on one on one basis and they will be able to take on the information to other peers. And then we shall be following up using SurveyMonkey to capture participants' knowledge after the training. And also, we are going to provide a survey before the training to see our participants. Uh, uh, fair, uh, uh, via digital security. The training schedule, the project training will take place on three consecutive days and will be on location. Just as I told you, the government is getting down workshops. We can't afford a one-day work, uh, a one-event workshop, which is also very expensive. But we can afford to reach out to small groups of people in their secure places, and the number for which uh, av after the project will be will be, will be very great. Will be 144 participants because they're going to train six participants from 24. LGBT and sex workers organization is uh, the multiplier effect. After training, you want 44 participants. The uh, number of people should be will multiply in a very, very big way because we know everyone needs the security. You're my friend and you didn't attend the training, and I know you're insecure. I'll have to train you, and if, if, if I don't train you, I'm also becoming insecure. I will send you an, a message which is not encrypted, and they will get your message and they will know it came from him. So we're hoping of a multiplier effect in this project. Yes, for God and my country, I'm Chigonya Daniel from Uganda. The struggle continues. Thanks for listening to me. Mueva Lenyo. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, ask colleagues. Yeah, and in fact, I have a question about the, uh, the danger situation of the LGBTI uh, community in Uganda. Is this a question related to the legal framework? I mean, it's, it, it is forbidden in your country to, uh, to conduct any uh, uh, homosexuality. Uh, I beg your pardon. I didn't have any sense at this time. Is, I mean, I'm, I'm asking about the legal framework of, of, of the LGBTI community in uh, Uganda. Mm. Uh, well, uh, our penal code uh, prohibit, prohibits canon rage against nature. But they don't say what is unnatural and what is natural. But most of the uh, law enforcers have gone ahead to uh, enforce this current rage against nature law to say that homosexuality is criminal in our constitution. But there's no legal law in Uganda prohibiting any person from holding meetings. But government is just doing it without a law in press. And we actually, we are challenging Father, Father Simon Rokodo in court for closing down our meetings. Four meetings, we are in court with him. And the other thing is that there is a proposed bill in Parliament, which uh, Parliament wants to pass before they go in recess in December. Uh, maybe most of you heard about the scandal our Speaker of Parliament had with the Canadian Foreign Minister, 
When she came back, she was welcomed like a hero, and Parliament uh, moved a motion to honor her, and also to pass the bill before December when they go in holiday. But there's no law prohibiting, they're just doing it illegally, and that's what we are, try we are trying to fight, and actually that's what we are fighting. Thank you very much, Nagat. Yeah, um, uh, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> since you are going to um, address a marginalized community, and uh, issue is very sensitive in your country. So I'm just wondering if you have done any risk assessment of such like project? We've done risk assessment, not particularly for this project, but for other projects we've been having in Uganda. Uh, we, know, uh, we, know, we know how to, to be secure because that's why we opted for to meet people in their secure places as opposed to meeting an, uh, in an auto where government can you know, quickly jump on us. Most of these organizations don't have like former buildings or uh, offices. They are in residential areas. So it's very hard for government to trace that there's a civilian organization here, there's a gay organization here. That's where we are going to meet as opposed to public places where government can easily land on us. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, have, I have a two-stage question. You mentioned that your organizations are using the databases. My first question is what type of, do what type of documentation uh, you're documenting and what is that work about that government wants to get their hands on and then the second question would be you know once when they get those documents how they use them uh, against you in the legal or um, outside the legal processes uh, I'll start with your last question how, how they use the documents uh, when they get these documents they go and do edits but remember the documents have our signatures below for example they made uh, just add a single line by the end of December, we want to have recruited uh, maybe 300 students, university students. They had it in our work plan. So if they had this in our work plan, it means that a, uh, if we have a case in court, like the, the case against the Father Francis Simon recorded for shutting down our, our workshops, they can easily present this document and say, look here, in their work plan, they want to recruit. And the father is saying he's stopping their workshops because they are recruiting. And the second thing uh, about the databases, uh, the information we keep here is just the minutes, maybe from a previous meeting. Uh, because this doc document actually, the government got hold of. It, why, there are meetings from our general meeting. Uh, the coalition is formed in a way that it's not an organization, but a network of 51 orga uh, civil society organizations. So they said, whichever organization attended this meeting, this game meeting, we are shutting it down. Because uh, homosexuality is unacceptable and illegal in our culture. That's what they see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause for Daniel. Thank you very much, Daniel. Next, now we have Kamal Sedra, an activist from Egypt who represents a regional development organization working in ICTs. Okay. I'm so happy to be here to talking about uh, one of my dreams. Um, I present uh, Internet Without Borders uh, project. Uh, okay, I'm working as a founder and managing director of DESK. It's a regional uh, Middle East based organization that works in the field of human rights and the freedom of, ex of exhibition. And also I work as a senior technical advisor for ICT for Beast Foundation in Switzerland. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Desk Development is a regional organization founded in 2005 to support civil society organizations and activists by provide them with new techniques and knowledge to enhance their capacity to effectively serve the community better. Desk managed over 50 projects uh, some of them uh, are regionally and the others are locally in Egypt, Tunisia, Iraq, and Lebanon. Um, I, I, I get some snapshots of our project. Uh, one of them are uh, ushahed.org. It's a, a platform to monitor the election using Ushahidi. 
and uh, we we work with Ushahidi to develop the second and third version of Ushahidi uh, technology and also we arabize the software and uh, put it uh, uh, open source for all for free and we start this during our old regime till now we still working uh, also we implement the same idea in uh, Tunisia and Libya um, next project is a uh, website also is nazaha-ishid.net uh, it's a it's a, it's a Consider in, uh, it's working uh, to highlight the corruption issues in Egypt, and I hope soon will work in Middle East. Uh, uh, we got a prize for from eDemocracy Forum and the Politics Online uh, as one of the top ten websites who changed the politics and world in 2009 for this website because it, it, it attracted a lot of people, uh, a lot of traffic, and also also we we make a lot of um, uh, success stories in uh, in this issue in Egypt. And also Aswatna Dash EG, uh, we started this website in 2005 as platform for voter education, and it was the first uh, uh, idea to make voter education online in Egypt. Another project we have also uh, e-learning uh, platform called NGO School. Um, it's now we we work in all over the Egypt. We have two offices, and also uh, we have a lot of trainings for NGOs and activists. Um, and we broadcast all the trainings online. And after we finish the trainings, we um, edited the videos and then put it uh, in YouTube and the website for free for, for all. We have now under construction iintrutcher.org. Uh, it's a, a regional website that will uh, work in Trutcher. And EGTube, it's uh, another project we built like a YouTube for Egyptian activists. And we learned them how to record videos by mobiles to 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 present their pro local problems and we make like a, a, a competition in our website and a lot of several trainings in a lot of uh, Middle East countries about uh, most of them about new media technology and digital security uh, at the beginning I want to highlight some some sit the situation in our region in uh, um, Middle East and North Africa uh, this from Freedom House last report 2012 you will find uh, that most of the countries is is over 50. It's mean a lot of problems for the internet freedom. And the, the next slide, it's mean we go down. Now after after the Arab Spring, uh, Arab activists are face problems more than before. Uh, it's not any words I said, but you can follow a lot of news about Till now, um, our president, as example in Egypt, he released a lot of people uh, 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 from the jail, uh, but he didn't release most of the uh, freedom of expression or internet activists, which which write as their ideas online. The project is uh, seek to contribute the internet freedom to the Middle East and North Africa, provide NGOs, young cadres, activists, and bloggers with the necessary uh, instrument and skills, which enable them to. Uh, employ digital security tools to eff effectively protect their data and uh, electronic sites against attacks and the blocking. Our project target is three main uh, areas, NGO young cadres, activists and the bloggers, which increased many, many times after the revolution. Um, uh, a lot of people were not involved in our public life or in politics, but after our revolution in Egypt and in Arab Spring in Tunisia and a lot of countries, most of the people now is interested to, to be online. And uh, maybe 95% of them don't know what the meaning of digital security and what they can do to, to, to save themselves. The project is two main, uh, two main uh, activity. First activity is interactive platform in Arabic and, uh, uh, and uh, attached to uh, uh, social networks like Facebook, uh, uh, YouTube, and uh, Twitter. Um, this will take about two months, and after th these two months, uh, uh, Desk will take care about the website, like our uh, a lot of websites. So we didn't close any website from 2005. Even the project is closed, like Nazaha, you see, or, or Yushahed, it's still working. This website will contain online tips, uh, a list of the necessary software with Arabic easy manuals, online support, uh, and news, links to international organizations which active uh, uh, in this field, uh, I, I, I saw a lot of websites online that talk about digital security. Most of them are English and a little bit Arabic websites. And uh, what I what I faced in our 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 training that most of the people cannot understand the language which 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 uh, 
which which uh, in this website uh, especially the new users of the internet for them it's very difficult that's what i i'm trying to to put in our website is to to make this language easy to understand from non-professional people in risk the other uh, the other uh, activity is uh, two TOT training workshop, one in Egypt and one in Tunisia. Uh, every training will be uh, three days for 25 participants uh, during the, the three months. This training will, will give them advanced training for, for not um, uh, beginners, but it's for activists, active people to, and this, this uh, trainees will, will participate after that to our website to make the technical support for others. So we need to train trainers to go to uh, their countries and then they, they, they can help uh, their colleagues and their friends, even if they, they are not their friends, but they are friends online, so they can support online. Um, we will train them in, yani, as, we kn as we understand it uh, from malware and uh, hacking programs, protection, their information from physical threats, uh, basic tips about secure password, uh, protection, sensitive data, anonymity, uh, mobile security, uh, access block websites, and uh, secure online communication like e e email secure uh, or, uh, or chat, uh, voice, or even uh, uh, texts. That's all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, Kamal. Come in here. How are you, Rebecca? No. My God. Um, I was just thinking that you said that you you are going to put these training videos on YouTube, right? How you are going to like uh, the people who are in the in the trainings? how you are going to protect the, the identity as our experience we only record the trainer not the trainees yani for three days of uh, training about uh, strategic planning we have only one hour of training we we put it in 10 videos every video is 10 minutes so we didn't uh, uh, record the questions we didn't record anything we only record the training to be as an e-learning module, not uh, to... So it's to the module, yeah. right? Yes. You are talking about... Right. Thank you. Thank you, Nagad. Um, one question from me. Uh, why digital security tools now? I mean, you know, in Tunisia and Egypt, today, why? What are the threats? Are they bigger than they were, or they are smaller, or what, what's happening? Can you give us some insight? Okay, first uh, of all, the website will be for Arab-speaking people, not only Tunisia and Egypt, but I select Tunisia and Egypt. We have a lot, because there is a lot of good activists there, they can support our website. Um, maybe now in Egypt, is not that before, but I think in the future, <laughs> near future. And uh, I already worked with a lot of people from Syria, from Lebanon, and uh, from Morocco, uh, and from Western Sahara, Libya, uh, Yemeni, all of these people need uh, information easy to understand and easy to, to be applicable because uh, I, I am a trainer and I train digital security for a lot of Arab countries and when I visit all what I, I, I said to them is new and uh, if, if they are not uh, a good users they, they face a lot of difficulty to understand if I want to make easy to use for all Arab countries and um, I, I don't think uh, in the near future our region will be stable. Yani, so you need to, to need to be b take care as an activist when you start to, to be an activist online. And, and and one last question. I mean, who is your audience? Since that you mentioned that you work in a lot of or many Arabic countries, and those organizations, I assume that they're all different profiles. Can you tell us a little bit who was on your trainings and who is your main audience? I mean, by the type of their work, scope of their work. Um, I, I'll give some example. We, we, we started in 2007 a program for uh, youth. It, it's called, uh, um, I don't remember the name, but it, uh, uh, to, to bring youth to be uh, uh, participated in public life. Uh, we targeted in Egypt 35,000 youth uh, by smart program. We train 50, uh, 15 uh, trainer with, uh, with uh, the program called the Bridge Project from United Nations. And then they train 500 
uh, youth leader and the 500 youth users train their colleagues. Um, in Egypt, uh, our NGO school, till now, after two years of working, we trained to 2,200 NGO all over the Egypt. In Tunisia, I, I uh, implement a project for uh, two projects, one of uh, the two for uh, monitoring the elections there. Uh, and we, we I met maybe every place in, in, uh, in, in Tunisia for training and consultation with a lot of NGOs, especially youth organizations, uh, which started after the revolution. Um, in Lebanon, there is a lot of groups. I cannot say it's an uh, organization and it's secret. <laughs> and it's also okay, in yeah. Western Sahara, the same. Thank you. And, and Negad, I have one short question. Yeah. Um, th there will be uh, two TOTs, one in Tunisia and one in o Egypt, right? Yeah. So what will be your follow-up strategy after these TOTs? Um, it's like a code in, in my organization that we start the training and uh, it, it will not end, that we are online support. Our, our Facebook page in, um, in Facebook, it's uh, 102,000 uh, 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 fellow in our Facebook page. That's uh, why in every training we tell the people to go and we are uh, uh, continuous support. If you ask any question anytime, you will find us. Uh, uh, and also these people uh, we will work with, they will participate in our website like an admin to support the others. Uh, we have experience to make a secure websites because most of our websites are sensitive and we can hide their identity and give them a new identity they, they can talk. And I think from my experience in these two countries especially, we have a, a very good um, uh, 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 colleagues and friends there. And all of them, I think they will, will support as they do in a lot of projects with me. Most of my projects are depends on volunteers. Uh, especially uh, election monitoring. I have thousands of volunteers working with us. Uh, I think it's uh, from our desk experience. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Kamal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kamal. Next up, we have Tai Tai Ang from Myanmar, Burma, and she's with, she's a program manager with the Myanmar ICT for Development Organization. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tai Tai Aung from Myanmar. I come to represent an organization called Myanmar ICT for Development. And um, actually, I have a more fancy presentation than this. But um, my colleagues from back home couldn't send me in time, maybe because their internet went down. So it makes me want to push this issue on internet freedom <laughs> more. Okay. Um, Uh, before presenting about the project, um, I want to um, introduce about the organization I'm working for. Um, before studying this um, Yama ICT for Development, or we call NIDO in short, we were from a group of Myanmar Blogger Society. Um, Myanmar Blogger Society uh, played a big role during 2007 Saffron Revolution, where um, uh, most of the information um, which is happening within the country. It's leaked um, it's, um, leak by most of the people from the MBS. So after that, we were um, regarded as blacklist. Some of our friends were arrested, and um, internet were censored, blogs were censored, and the main blogging platform that we use were censored. So since that time, we started working on um, freedom of expression online and uh, rights to information online. And um, after um, after 2010, um, our um, after our election, we felt that um, we must um, involve more in this um, democratic transition to make um, to help it in order not to turn backwards. So we formed a group called um, NIDO, and we focus more on empowering citizens with um, capacity. Um, building capacity building on ICT and um, 
advocate and encourage stakeholders to uh, develop a user-centered ICT and internet policy. So what we do is uh, we, give, uh, we do capacity building programs, uh, we work on digital rights, and we advocate. So we give, um, as a middle, we give trainings, particularly to um, political parties, journalists, civil societies, and NGOs, um, and activists um, around the country. And um, we also initiated a campaign called Protect Us, which focus more on um, internet user rights. So why, why are we um, doing this internet freedom forum? I, we believe that internet is a unique place to practice democracy and human rights. So um, promoting internet freedom in our country is also like promoting democracy and human rights for our country. And um, for internet freedom, the very basic block is the access to internet. In a country of a uh, population of over 50 million, we have only 2% of internet penetration rate. And um, it just increased because due to the um, mobile network, um, uh, mobile data network that the government has opened a year ago. And um, our country also sh um, had the national bandwidth of a uh, total of four gigabyte for the whole country. So we can say that internet accessibility rate is very low there. And also Myanmar is always in the, um, in the previous time, it's in the dark zone of the internet. And uh, by freedom of, um, by Freedom House um, reports, recently reports, it's a, it has been listed as not free and by uh, reporters without borders, it was listed as the enemy of the internet. So internet um, freedom issue is a very uh, big issue that we must um, address in our country. And during the recent speech by our president when he was at the UN, he stated that Myanmar is now enjoying internet freedom. But he was quite wrong because he was just saying that Myanmar is free because the government has ceased internet censorship. But that doesn't mean that internet freedom, that we are enjoying internet freedom because we have very, um, we have a l only a little bit of chance of rights to access and then um, we are still being surveillance, monitored and there's still self-censorship within our, our, our mindset. So we can say that internet freedom is not what we are enjoying in the country. So as to uh, make a spotlight of this issue, we, we planned to hold an internet freedom forum in Myanmar, which participants mainly coming from cyber activists, netizens, journalists, uh, civil societies, and um, um, other human rights defenders. So they will be voicing their says about internet issues on that forum. So we will be making a report surveys from, from that forum. So that will be added as a hard evidence for us to advocate for that issue in the future. Um, this is the um, websites of internetfreedom.org. And recently I was searching about it and it was block access tonight. And the goal of our project is to promote and encourage internet freedom and to foster internet rights as human rights in Myanmar. So these are the objectives. And we will, have it, we will do our internet freedom forum. And after that, we will, have, uh, we will be doing a report of Myanmar internet freedom issues. And then we will be building a network to monitor internet censorship around the country. Because in, in Myanmar, there's a different policy, different censorship fo policy for every city and every um, service provider that is given. So it is not possible to uh, track them without using this crowd participation. So we will be um, building a network with the participants coming in to the um, Internet for, uh, Freedom Forum and then we will be reporting uh, monthly about the reports of that. And also we will be doing public awareness through media, through social media and things like that too. So why are we doing this? Why us? Uh, what is our capacity of doing this? So we are known as a, 
uh, as a group campaigning on Myanmar for freedom of expression issues. And we have also held um, other seminars, events, workshops successfully. And we, all we had also co-organized Barcamp Yango, which was status as world biggest with uh, the appearance of Doang San Suu Kyi talking about ICT. And we also have um, very good media attention on our group. So even if we, um, we did this forum or not, we are contacted by local medias when, uh, when, we, was doing, um, um, when we was doing our social media, social media advertising to vote for our, vote for our project. So this, this, was, um, this was from the local media um, covering about our project by Freedom House. And this was the same too, our um, project covered by the local medias. And um, this was the s events that we had held successfully before. So even if I w we win this uh, contest or not, I already felt that we are the winners because we already have spotlights in our home country about um, work starting working on these issues. And I'm very um, honored to be here to be um, presenting with all these um, wonderful, great projects. And then um, myself is very um, happy to be here to join this um, big IGF too. So I already felt that I'm a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tai Tai. Um, I will turn to Halad. Yeah, th thank you very much for your presentation and uh, good luck for <laughs> Myanmar and uh, all the uh, internet users in Myanmar. We know that uh, the situation there is not so easy. So uh, my question is, is related mainly to uh, the risk assessment. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, knowing the situation in Myanmar, I think uh, you guys, if you will uh, do this, you will probably have uh, persons injured or jaded or, or whatever. So what is your, did you uh, have any evaluation of the risk that you are taking in, uh, in doing such project? Um, the risk of us will be also our opportunity because this is the time when our government is trying so hard to build it, build the image um, within the international community. So if um, if something um, if if any risks or happens during our um, uh, event or um, doing doing the project, um, it will highlight the issue more, and then um, our risks will more like be our opportunity for that. Thank you. Maybe I do have a question. Um, I have something along those lines. I mean, um, looking in organizing the first uh, multi-stakeholder forum in, in Myanmar, what do you think is the biggest challenge or what would be the biggest challenge uh, to make it a success? Um, uh, previously, we thought the biggest challenge for us will be having a permit to um, hold such a big event because um, we need permission from the uh, authorities to um, to gather more than five people. But um, now the government, the political situation is opening, and um, I think it's it's a good time good time for us to um, to hold such an event, and it will be um, a big stepping stone uh, about the uh, addressing the issue on internet freedom in our country. And I have two, two more questions. One is more, uh, you mentioned uh, that every city is having its own censorship policy. Can you just give us a gist? Um, how is that? Is that based on the ISP policies? Are the ISPs the ones that are implementing those? Or, or why is that? Um, we have, um, we have a nas main national gateway, and then we have um, a multiple local service provider. And uh, from the local service provider, they have um, um, offices, main offices, in uh, different cities that they, they they provide the service. So um, each and every one of the those cities, they have, um, um, just like I've stated, has a different uh, censorship policy because when I'm in Yango, blogspot is, blogger is open, www.blogger is open. But when I was in Mandalay, blog, blogger is, um, it's unaccessible. And um, we also have um, surveillance things like, um, especially in Mandalay, um, there we found that um, 
there are men in the uh, certificate errors, like men in the middle attack, for especially for Gmails. So we can say that each city has its own um, um, different policy. And one last question yes. um, uh, would be uh, Myanmar yesterday and Myanmar today. Uh, and we talk about interference. What changed? And you mentioned that you know change in the government policies to look good, and we are all witnessing the very promising path. Although we all have some you know back thoughts, but uh, mm. we all hope that it will continue. So, can you give us the people that do not follow Myanmar closely um, what changed in the terms of your work um, for better currently? Um, in in our work, um, I mean, in in our world, um, everything is different from one week to another. It's changing very rapidly. Um, the uh, the most um, significant thing that we face is um, now we are allowed to be officially registered as an NGO, but in the later we are not. So I think that is a big impact for us, so that we can work and focus more on our work. Thank you very much, Tai Tai. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tai Tai. So up next, we have Anas Halali. Anas uh, fled Syria because of persecution he faced after posting something on Facebook. And he now lives in Dubai, and he works with a group of Syrian cyber activists to support internet users in repressive countries. Thank you. Ladies, just a second. Yeah, yeah, we, ladies we and have gentlemen, thank you for being here. My name is Anas. I would have loved to say that I am from somewhere. Previously, pro project. Ah, sorry. Uh, previously, the project would have been under the Syrian Center of Media uh, and spe uh, Free Speech, but the founder Mazen Darwish is in prison, hopefully alive. We don't know details, and all the others either in prison or left the country. So now I'm representing myself and a team of uh, technical people and been pitching for the project that we call Virtus Linux. It's already, it's already there, I will explain. This is the version two of the software. Of course, I will not like talk much about politics because most of you already know what is happening now in Syria. Just a quick, brief uh, numbers. Since the start of revolution, we have around 40,000 casualties. Of them, more than 1,000 being killed in prison. They were inside the prison. We don't know how much of these people actually were captured based on the practices that the government impose. Actually, what they have, they have a lot of high technic uh, high technology and sophisticated the equipment probably uh, from western countries as well as from Iran and China uh, they have this deep packet inspection which e enables them to know exactly what you're doing what uh, what is the traffic for the stream of traffic on the internet man in the middle where they impose to be a, s a, s a source of trusted intermediate between someone and the uh, the website that you're trying to browse, malwares, and of course, internet cafes are all monitored, and there's some paid huge number of people that they call themselves the electronic army, the Syrian electronic army, that always try to uh, polish the Syrian government in the media, Twitter, or they sh try to flood or like bomber hashtags for, twi for Twitters and other or, or YouTube or other social medias, as well as getting passwords for accounts under torture. It has been reported for many people who were in, imprisoned and they let out, they have imposed like very severe ways of torture to just extract some passwords for them. What they want is like to get the activist account so they know who's fr who's his friends are, what are the communication they're exchanging, so that also, They cannot hear me? Yeah. 
uh, and what are the email, the uh, not a communication method of communication, or maybe places for meetings and stuff like this. What is Virtus and why is Virtus? Actually, Virtus is a li live operating system based on Linux. So it's open source and it's free. Why? Because it hides tracks offline and online. For offline, once the, uh, okay, just a quick live means here for non-technical people, live operating system means that you don't have to actually install it on your computer. You can run it from any external media like a USB or CD. Once you stop using that software, you just need to extract the CD or just unplug the USB and everything that you've done has disappeared. Everything, they cannot just take the laptop and see what you've done. Online, it provides secure connection by encryption, like hiding the stream of data that is going from your computer to the target server or what wherever your target is. It, the most important thing is it is tested to work within the Syrian blockage because we have s users inside who can just report to us that now it's working, they change this, it's not working, and then we quickly try to find a workaround for this. Supports multimedia. I will explain later why this is very important. And this is the team I'm talking about. We have many people who are already inside Syria who are use using this for day to day, so we had good feedback, quick updates whenever we need. Okay, uh, some might say we have already some similar s solutions out, uh, out there, so like the tour and details. Why do we need to get another system? Actually, uh, we are not reinventing the wheel, but these systems, they have limitations when, uh, when it comes to Syria. The one major reason for people not like using Tor in Syria, it, like, it does not support video. And YouTube has become the number one w uh, like reporting tool for the ci citizen journalists. As you all know, there's no, uh, let's say, independent, there's no independent press allowed in Syria since last year. No Jazeera, no CNN, no BBC, none of them. The, they only allowed like the supporting the internal local media and the Irani media. So people took it with their mobiles on their hand cams and they forced it online. Because Tor and Tales, they do not allow usage of video, then it's not like many people try refrain from using and that will cause like they will jeopardize their own safety and security. Also, of course, there's a very li limited support for different type of encryptions, uh, slow speed or bandwidth because it relies on others. It does not have a dedicated server for, the for itself. The updates in regarding the Syrian issue, I'm not talking updates in general, in regarding Syrian is issues, it's not as quick uh, as the Virtus because we are in direct contact. If there's any update needed for Tor, it might take some time to be uh, issued. The Virtus 2, now we have the Virtus up and running, uh, working fine. Now we're, what we're, we're proposing to have the Virtus 2, which is having our own dedicated servers to host the connections and it will still use the Tor. If some user still wants to use the previous method, it will still use that one. Uh, we worked a lot on the interface. I will show you some screenshots ahead, how it's different between the second and the first version. And we have many more uh, tools that are built in for like citizen journalists. They have video editing built in the system. They have something, uh, spreadsheet, uh, word processor, whatever tools that someone might need for day-to-day -day work. As well as, uh, the sorry, uh, instant messaging for easy communication between parties. Uh, complete solution to reducing the pressure, I mean the pressure on the server. We have tried our best to minimize the traffic so that we can serve more people with the same amount of bandwidth that we have. The VPN, quickly, th I will not go into details uh, with these, but this the encryption methods that we are going to implement uh, within the VPN network that we're proposing. And how we are going to support users. Actually, we have a lot of one-on-one uh, one -on -one team members who are already doing 
uh, this kind of support. These, sorry. Uh, these three names are like, this is myself. Delshad is the founder and the, who is the main uh, programmer. And Hamid also is a ma part of the member. The others, I cannot mention their names because many of them are still in Syria and we don't want him to have any troubles. We will establish an Arabic and English website. We will also create forums and we ticketing system if you have a, a problem that you can submit, emails. In social media as well, Facebook pages, Google Plus pages, Twitters, etc. We plan ahead to have a third version, Virtus, which is uh, actually when it will be the Virtus two will be in use. For sure, the government will try to to try to just block it, and then we will have to always keep on introducing new ways to p bypass the regulation. Also, the updated tools, and we are planning since it's already uh, up and running and well, uh, like uh, stable. We can add extra languages. One of the, the colleagues that we have is a Kurdish, so he also knows Kurdish very well. So he can also add a third language, which is just the interface, and fine-tune performance just to get faster services. The Virtus team, without mentioning proper names, just it will consist of these people. If we get the fund from the uh, incubator, this is how we're going to invest it. We have developers, we have equipment that we need to ha to rent some servers online. We have m some travels that we, we need to meet sometimes because all the team are out of Syria and they are scattered in different locations and like other expenses. And th this is the total funding for the project. This part is the IGF. Uh, incubator, uh, I mean the Freedom House incubator if, if we got the prize. And the others we managed to s secure from internews. We have some donations and we have other donations either by us or someone else. This is the current version of the Virtus One. This is the logo and this is the interface of the Virtus Two. Some screenshots. Uh, different uh, VPN connections. Thank you very much. Uh, just one last question be before the end of this conference. Sorry, uh, the final version will be up and hosted on the server. We already have the server is just or the storage there, but we just like uploading. But we have some problem due to the time differences between the people who are the trying to communicate with, e with each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nas, very much. Um, I will. Um, I will turn to Negad. Yeah, um, it was wonderful presentation. I really Thank like you. it. So, um, I have a question: that why Linux only? Why not Windows and Mac? Okay, good question. The reason is, for okay. Linux is an uh, open source and free. As current situation in Syria. To be honest, we don't have a copyright protection, so a, a Windows copy equals as much as a Linux copy. But on the long term, if we're going to have like adaptation worldwide, you would have to pay Microsoft for the license of Microsoft or for the Windows or the Mac OS, which is also limited to the hardware itself. So Linux is like cross-platform. I'm not now we're talking about Linux versus other operating system, but Linux is a cr cross-platform. You can use it on a Mac if you want. You can use it on a PC, you can use it wherever you want. Also, the, the, the thing that is uh, very important, which is open source. It's easy to modify or edit the source if we need to change anything of the system. While for Microsoft, if we need to change or alter anything, they will not provide source code. That's their secret of trade. So that it's a closed box. We don't know much about the environment. I hope I answered. Uh, and uh how you will uh, get access to your targeted audience since you are in Dubai and you have scattered team in Syria, so? We have already a team. We have already uh, more than 1,500 users for the version one. And we just cannot promote it much more because now it will just throttle each other. If the, th the link, the people say it will have slow uh, performance, we fear that they will abandon the project. So we don't want to just let the next version out unless we have secured something that we can like, 
improve the performance so that if we have many users, they will not interfere with each other performance like the network here earlier. Too many users using the same bandwidth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I, I like the presentation as well, uh, and I have many questions, in fact. Okay. Uh, the first question is uh, about the, uh, you said uh, people will use it through a USB key, so yes. what what kind of personal information will uh, will be um, put it in the USB key or, or, or archive it? And uh, also the question is if uh, by any, by any um, uh, opportunity or, or, or problem, uh, this person will lose the USB key, and if it turns to anyone from the regime, uh, Syrian regime, and he will find uh, the software itself, is this uh, will be dangerous for your uh, core system or not? No, actually, the I will answer the second question than the first one. The second question is, if this USB, the source, or let's say the application itself, since it's an open source, we are about to keep it as an open source, so anyone ha can have a look. It's already hosted in SourceForge, so anyone can download it from there. So they don't need to have the key itself. There's no personal anything stored in this. What you do is just download it. There's a steps that how you can make this USB bootable. You plug it into your computer, you turn on, you're up. Your account, your passwords, and everything, you, ha you have to like memorize them or keep them in your mind. We're just providing the means or the tools for you to connect safely. And if you someone like, and it happens a lot, they will say, okay, there's a raid in this area, like in five or ten minutes. They can see you just like unplug it, and you keep your standard whatever Mac, Mac OS or Windows you have. It's very legitimate, even if you want to have some games and whatever on that. So you will not be any any suspicious. You do not look any suspicious to them. So. Okay, I, I have another question in yeah, regards sure. to the project itself. So you s you said that the version one is already running and you have more than fifteen thousand users. Fifteen hundred users. Fifteen hundred users yes. in, in in Syria. Uh, what what is I mean what is the reason that you that I mean why you are here today? If you have already developed the version two and and you have a team, I mean what 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 is why um, how you can convince us as judge that we need to sp to accept your project. Uh, if not, I mean, this th there will be a dangerous situation for the project or for the team or whatever. Okay. The 1,500 users is like the top that this system as it is can hold. More than that, it will, like like I said, it will start throttling each other. The Virtus 2 mainly will be focused on having our own servers for keeping our own VPN servers so that we can serve much more users without worrying about it will be like uh, affecting each other usage. So let's say we want to have 1,000 users. With the current thing that we have, we cannot afford that because they will start reporting that it's not working, it's very slow, it's slower than before. We need to have this investment in, mostly it will be in the servers, oh sorry, in the servers so that we can serve more connections and everyone will be able to use the service that we're providing. I hope I have answered. Thank you. Uh, just just one small quick question for the people that are not tech savvy. Uh, I assume that this Virtus Linux is based on the Ubuntu, right? Yes. Uh, because there was a slide, and then the second question, uh, actually, just a question. Uh, I think that the, your second version is kind of a mimicking Windows. Is that on purpose? <laughs> actually, yes, because. <laughs> Most of the users, like I said, we don't have copyright protections there, so price of Microsoft Windows copy is like nothing. So people are used to Microsoft. If you tell them that you need, for your own security, you have to learn a new thing, most of them are not technical people. So we can we try to make it as friendly as possible. We also, pla we also have on the desktop, if you've seen that pre previous, I'm not sure if it's very visible. Okay, here it's not visible, but here, here, I'm sorry. Here it says in Arabic, Talimat Istikhdam. So it's even Arabic, simple way to just try to go around with this if you it's a new environment to you or whatever. Thank you very much, Anas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Our thank you very much, Anas.
Our next to last presentation comes from Edmund Yakani, who is the executive director at the, sorry, Civil Community Empowerment for Progress organization in the world's news country, South Sudan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as um, she introduced me, my name is uh, Edmund Yakani. I work as a coordinator with SEPO. I come from South Sudan. Our project is mainly looking at advocacy and awareness raising on legal framework. Our uh, wow. Our targeted audience is uh, 50 civil society and activists. Our indirect beneficiaries will be the internet users family in general. And the context of my country, South Sudan, we have not signed any international treaties on human rights, whether at UN level or AU. Secondly, our constitution have recognized human rights in the Bill of Rights. Among them is the freedom of expression, association, assembly, rights of access to information. And South Sudan will have general election in 2015. And we have a delay in registration of political parties, so yet we have a one-party system. So that creates for us this problem with regard to internet freedom. Our constitution has controversial provisions, such as national security against public interest. What does it mean? Nobody knows. But with that, it's been used against internet uh, freedom activists. Like right now, we have five activists which are not using whether Facebook or Twitter. I'm one of them. And then due to lack of legal framework like media bill or cyber law, these have created really limitation to access to freedom of internet. For instance, the government is licensing internet providers at high price and that will have limited access to internet services. So the needs that we feel need to be delivered is one, to sensitize the civil society and the community at large on the freedom of internet Secondly, is to raise advocacy and lobby for legal framework on internet freedom in the constitution and national bills like the media, the national security, the cyber registration regulations. These are opportunities available for us in South Sudan. One, South Sudan is in process of making a permanent constitution. A commission is already formed and we have won five seats in the commission. The media bill is now under public hearing in South Sudan. Our country is developing soon national security bill and Adam Smith, a British firm which is running the bill. Soon we are going to review the internet registration regulations. And then our organization, SEPO, we have a website which is registered in a foreign country because due to absolute legal framework. And then it's been managed by four volunteers who are IT experts. Our goal is really to create understanding on the access to information and sharing through functional websites and other social media. Our specific objective is one, to raise awareness on the right to access to information in the civil society role in building a nation through having that advanced technology to train the activists on digital security, risk assessment, and management techniques, and then to support SEPO website to publish the work of human rights defenders and then legal framework. These are key activities. We shall conduct campaigns regarding the legal framework and access to, uh, to internet. We shall create a platform of website where at least provide people to discuss issue of freedom of internet and those are conduct trainings on digital security, risk assessment, management, internet freedom, advocacy and lobby skills. These are things that which will add or will mark our work. We're going to have a media campaign articles and messages, debate topics. We're going to print out sample of legal framework which work in other countries. Our expected results are, one is internet freedom is granted by constitution or bill. Two, free internet website that everyone can learn, can gain knowledge and ideas. And then we're going to raise up debates on internet freedom, human rights defenders protection bill to start. And then that's so citizens of South Sudan to realize that and recognize that internet is a new platform for expressing their freedoms and rights. Our indicators is that legal framework on internet freedom is secured by the constitution or the bills. We have a lot of bills coming up. And then free space for internet services is created. Number of debates on internet freedom, human rights, defenders, protection is increased. Number of South Sudanese have a knowledge on the importance of internet freedom. This is our experience. We have been running for three years uh, internet uh, uh, cyber 
with the website which is free for civil society and activists is funded by accord accord is a an organization a british organization and then also we have a strength of advocates and lobby with the strengths we are able to establish south sudan human rights defenders network is currently existing and we have worked with adam smith international on security sector reform for the last two, for the last year and we have professional it volunteers available so you may ask me are there no risk in this project we have risk one risk is that security organs may temper with this project but we have at least national stakeholders like parliament like un mission in south sudan are going to use them adam smith and eu human rights facility we may have logistics of getting out to the remote areas because infrastructure is bad but we can use un flights what do we need just we need 15000 us dollars to make this dream realize you may ask us can we manage this money at least we have a board of trustee and then even including you you are going to be our beneficiaries online as we put up the project you are going to observe the project i'm going to ensure the project is managed properly we have james hitler not hitler of, no, of uh, german this is our hitler in south sudan he will manage the project activities we have alice who is an mne officer will manage the project on timely line and then we are using computerized financial system by our accountant at the end of the day this as i said you may ask who are we thank you very much for listening i wish you support all the questions of internet human rights legal framework we shall obtain the new country in a new law so that we can use it as sample in other countries thank you thank you edmund thank you very much um, regards our question yeah so yeah thank you for your presentation so my question is related to the internet uh, itself in south sudan how how the internet looks like in south sudan do you have uh, uh, South Sudanese ISP. Do you have? Uh, I, I I don't have any idea about what happened when you uh, split in two countries. So what happened for the internet? Yeah, internet. Um, we have internet in South Sudan. We have South Sudanese who are internet providers. That they are. We have foreign companies from Kenya, Uganda. That there are so many of them, including other from the Western world, from China. All they are available. So access to internet are there. That's why when the government realized the presence of internet and is already raising a lot of echoes and check and balances, that's why it immediately they rush to form these regulations, which is really to give a high price in licensing internet services. And the reason because they realize like what is happening in North Africa, in Egypt, what is happening in Egypt, in Tunisia, it may happen in our country, it happened in Uganda. So the internet is available there, but the only thing is that the regulations are really very tough. That's why we feel with our presence, having five seats in the National Constitutional Review Commission and being as a lawyers, actually, by the way, we are all lawyers in the organization that we're working on. We feel we have big opportunity of influencing legal framework for securing internet governance freedom in South Sudan. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, you mentioned that you're personally banned to use social networks. Can you tell us how that happened and how is that implemented? How that is done? That is done in such a way that we have two social media, Twitter and Facebook, where five are banned. What the government did is that the government, you know, it's, it's become a common practice in the world that the government hire their agencies. And the agencies involve even our friends. Like, I'll put up a Twitter in different way that does not represent me, but what they will do is they'll try to realize who are the networks that I'm tweeting with, who are my colleagues. Then what they do is they infiltrate my friendship, and then later on they realize that. And of course, with Facebook, it's very easy. They can know where I am. That's how they implement it. And then the risk is that always they'll keep on targeting the friends they fall as a victims of situation. Maybe because they feel we know the legal loopholes, then we can challenge them as a lawyers. Then they target our colleagues. That's why our board resorted to ban us the fact that we should not use Twitter and Facebook, but the other social media we use. So that is how it's spread. Thank you. Uh, another question. Um, you mentioned that government would tamper with the process or idea of this project and with the implementation as one of the risks. Um, can you tell me more why do you think that that would happen? That will happen in the sense that we feel our government have realized that internet is a strong tool of really calling public or even really bringing up public to make check and balance on the government. So what they did is that, as, as, as I've mentioned before, is that they really have their own agents that they have recruited to do that. So these agencies, if they realize we're doing that, this is an assumption. We assume that the security apparatus may come in to block us in that. That's why how do we mitigate? We mitigate 
we are going to use United Nations Mission in South Sudan Security Sector Unit, which is really engaging with our security organs in different sections. So we're going to use them to make sure that we mitigate this risk if it comes up. But I wish it may not come, because this is an assumption, which is between either it will happen or it will not happen. And can you, can you tell us more about the constitutional process? Where is that right now on the overall map? Um, uh, is, it, is it at the early beginning or, you know, and, and, and where your project comes into the game and, and what's the most crucial part that you see uh, that your project can bring the uh, uh, value added? Yeah, uh, the constitutional process have not yet kicked on. The good thing is that the government delayed the mandate and for us as activists, that's on the good news. They have not yet started the process. As I said, is that we have five seats in the constitution. So if it kick on, the opportunity we have is that at least we have five seats as activists within the commission. So we can influence, we represent votes within the commission if it comes to democratic votes. So at least we can influence the decision, that's one. What is the added value? The added value will be that if we get the grants for managing this project, then the issue of internet governance challenges, legal framework, which we have had just in the, in the morning session, I think we can sort it out. That one is an opportunity that has the added value that we can sort it out and can be replicated in other nations if other activists can realize the way how we use as activists South Sudan by really fighting for legal framework that provides freedom of internet in the constitution. So later on, we can come up with the rest of the bills. So that's, that's the added value that we have presence in the constitution. Thank you. And, and, and one last question would be, uh, uh, do you know, uh, and sorry for my ignorance, what's the internet penetration in South Sudan? Uh, the internet penetration is very high. I can't say it's below, it's not below 50%. The internet penetration is very high in South Sudan, simply because most of the young South Sudanese have been to the Western world. We take a lot of region for these 21 years in the fighting. We have been in East Africa, some of us travel to Europe, some travel to Asia. So at least technology, the digital technology we have access to as a young youth. That's why it's easy for us now. We find ourselves at risk because the government realized these guys are in back to the home and they know the technology, and they may use this technology for check and balances. Thank you very much, Edmund. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edmund. Up uh, for our final presentation, we have a research project on gender inequality and in internet use in Azerbaijan. And our presenter is Dr. Katie Pierce. She's assistant professor at the University of Washington. Hi, thank you. Sorry, we were running over from another presentation. Uh, so not all my team members are here, but uh, I hope to represent them well. Uh, so as you heard, uh, our project looks at internet freedom issues and gender inequality here in Azerbaijan. Uh, we're a team of four women. I'll tell you a little bit more about our team, and maybe they'll even be here to introduce themselves uh, in a moment. So, uh, okay, it's not just on screen. Uh, so our study looks at Azerbaijan. Normally when we present on Azerbaijan, we have to produce a map. We do not have to do that today, thankfully. Uh, to tell you a little bit about Azerbaijan, where you are at, uh, this is a small post-Soviet uh, petro state. Uh, this is a state that has been dominated by a father-son uh, presidential team for uh, since 1993, and in the last number of years, it's grown more and more repressive. Um, so, within Azerbaijan, uh, there are great deal, uh, there are a great deal of barriers to using the internet for political participation here. Uh, the internet, while it is open here, uh, there are very little blocks. Uh, in fact, this allows the government through its openness uh, to, in fact, uh, make examples out of people that even engage in mild dissent online. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, our research team works on this fairly extensively. Uh, so at this point, we want to turn to a tremendous inequality that exists in this country, both for political participation and for internet use, and that is for women. Uh, hopefully this looks okay on your small screens. If not, I can send you a link to it. Uh, but I just want to point out that there are tremendous gender differences in access to technology here in Azerbaijan. And this is analysis that I've done of nationally representative uh, public opinion data. 
So uh, as you can see more broadly, that just about anything related to the internet, frequent use, Facebook use, Old Nikolasniki, which is a popular Russian social networking site use, uh, three quarters of users in Azerbaijan are men. Only a quarter of users of these uh, tools are women. In terms of ever having used the internet, uh, which means that you could have used it once five years ago, it's not a very useful measure, but you can see that while 30% of Azerbaijani men have used the internet at least once, only 14% of Azerbaijani women have. Um, there's not big differences in mobile phone use, but we imagine that is a little bit more of a leash than uh, tremendous use. So with this, you have to say, okay, so there's gender inequality in Azerbaijan in tech use. That's what's the problem here. Well, what's important to acknowledge in Azerbaijan is because of the way that the regime is organized and because it's a government-owned media system, the internet is truly the only place in Azerbaijan where political imagination can take light. Um, while uh, you would not go as far as to say that the internet is reforming politics in Azerbaijan, it truly is the only free space for expression and for receiving information here because the government controls the media. With this, uh, we have to ask about women. Generally, in authoritarian societies and in uh, democratizing societies, we argue that women can be a force for positive change towards democratization. And while that may be the case here in Azerbaijan, because women are uh, less likely to use the internet, they're not only denied access to the internet, but they're denied access to the only political space available to them, which is uh, amplifying the inequalities that exist. So, oops, I'm sorry, I slipped aside. Um, so what do we want to do about this? Our proposal is with a larger goal of increasing both political participation uh, offline and online here in Azerbaijan. How we'd like to do this specifically is first examine the, uh, and analyze the roots, this is one of my team members who just came in from our other presentation, uh, examine and analyze the roots of women's online marginalization and the repercussions and outcomes of exclusion from the Azerbaijani political scene by looking at the obstacles and barriers that women are facing in accessing and using the internet. Secondly, we want to provide recommendations to increase women's internet use. Um, although most of our team are academics, uh, and this is a research project, and although it does absolutely nothing for our academic careers or obtaining tenure, we are completely dedicated to this region, and it is very important to us that we share our research findings with people that can do something about it. Also, we want to increase awareness and understanding amongst local and international actors, donor community, uh, development agencies, about the obstacles and barriers that women face here. And finally, we want to bring attention to the gender inequalities in internet use and contribute to efforts to make the internet more accessible to women. And this is true in Azerbaijan, but also in the world overall. Azerbaijan is certainly not alone in women having trouble accessing the internet and having political uh, access to politics. And so our findings here could hopefully make changes for findings for women it, it's in policy uh, recommendations for women everywhere. So how we plan to do, oh, how do I go back on this? Can you, other side, oh, thank you. Uh, so how do we plan to do this? In a research project. Uh, we've already secured bids from three firms uh, to conduct focus groups here in Azerbaijan in early 2013. Uh, we would do focus groups here. We would do focus groups capital city, regional city, and rural areas. We would do focus groups with women and men separately. We would do focus groups with both internet users and non-users. Uh, although there is some work done on uh, women's use of the internet, it is impossible to find works from women who don't use the internet. We need their voices to be heard, and so it's really important that we access them as well. Uh, we would also do in-depth interviews with relevant stakeholders and women across the country. After we get these findings, we would uh, do a con uh, constant comparative analysis. Uh, we would write the report, and in the summer of 2013, we would publish the report online, available to anyone, digitally, in English, Russian, and Azerbaijani. And then we would go on a campaign to promote the report and its findings to relevant stakeholders, uh, in particular using social media. Our entire team is uh, qu quite the social media fans. So our team, just briefly, it's two academics who are standing in front of you. Uh, we are American academics. Uh, 
but we exclusively focus on issues of technology within this particular region. Uh, because we've been focusing on this region for over a decade, we have language skills and in-country networks. Unlike a lot of research projects that just pop in the country, see what's there and write a report, we're committed. We really care about this region. We know this region. This is incredibly important to us as people and as professional academics. Uh, our two research members who are having problems getting into the building uh, right now because of their involvement in such projects, um, but they are outside in the hallway if you'd like, or in the outside the doors if you'd like to talk with them later. Uh, they are both well-known female uh, Azerbaijani intellectuals, well-known writers about women's issues and technology. One is a PhD student at George Mason University, and the other is a journalist in Turkey. Um, they have years of experience in women's advocacy here. So we feel as a group, uh, we bring the skills to the table to make this project happen. So why should you fund this project? Well, little is known about barriers to women's use of technology globally, not just in Azerbaijan, but globally. Secondly, doing rigorous research using uh, sophisticated methodological techniques will provide insights that we can't get from just having sad stories. Uh, we have stories about, uh, it's very common for uh, brides in Azerbaijan to give up their Facebook passwords to their, uh, their fiancés, for example. Those stories are very sad. But having empirically driven findings to support and contextualize those findings is incredibly important, too. Also, as I mentioned, we are committed to sharing the results with policymakers and making recommendations for stakeholders. We aren't just academics sitting in our comfy chairs. We like our comfy chairs, but we want to make sure that people that can do something about these problems have our research findings at hand. Finally, this is a, or secondly, this is a highly sustainable project. These findings will last for a long time. We'll involve training graduate students here in Azerbaijan and in the U.S. who will have access to the data and be writing on these projects themselves. This really lasts forever. Um, and the training that these students receive will last for their career lifetimes as well. Oops, one more back. Can someone click it one more back? Other sit back. Oh, other side. Ooh. Sorry, this is a very, back, back, back. Sorry, last slide, sorry. Yeah, the, 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 the. This is a very confusing little device. Okay, so finally, uh, the research findings could illuminate problems that are faced not only by women here in Azerbaijan, but 50% of the world's population. And so it's really important that we acknowledge that. So with that, oops. I had a slide of very sad Azerbaijani children that you missed, but uh, with that, we thank you very much, and we welcome questions. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, Nagat, do you have any questions? Um, Yeah, thank you so much, Kerry. Um, I feel that this um, this is a very important issue, women and ICTs. Um, but I'm I'm slightly concerned about the acknowledgement of this research, which is coming from the outsiders and not by the Azerbaijanis itself. So you you told us that there are two participants who are the, uh, who are Azerbaijanis, but they are having problems getting in, right? So if they are having problems getting in in this building. I mean, how do you see the level of acceptance of their research, you know, for the policymakers and the, for other stakeholders? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, it, this is an issue. I mean, I, I can tell you, it is incredibly difficult for us to do research in this region. Uh, this is something, though, that we've been dealing with for years. Uh, so it, it's a challenge. I will say that uh, our teammates out there, uh, so I, I do understand, I, and doing cross-cultural research is always challenging, um, and that's why we do partner with locals. As I mentioned, we work in this region all the time, so we're not just popping in. Uh, however, in terms of accessing people, I think that our team has credibility with policymakers outside of Azerbaijan, with the development community, with the NGO community here. Um, in terms of being able to access, for example, the Ministry of Education here that might be interested in this, for example, for training girls in uh, secondary and primary school. Um, it's a barrier we're going to have to face. Uh, that's why we're ensuring that all of our materials will be translated into local languages. 
Um, and we also have had some initial conversations with organizations here and NGOs, women's NGOs here that have agreed to act as a broker for us with government officials that they might have a, uh, that the government might have a fonder view of those uh, NGOs than they do of us. So as best as we can do, we're trying to work with that problem. Thank you very much. Paul? So thank you for your presentation. I think it's uh, an important matter, the uh, access uh, of women for the technology. Uh, and I agree with you that it's a common worldwide problem. Uh, I, I have a, a small question about your specific objectives that you mentioned. You mentioned like five or six objectives. What are the metrics that you will use to, uh, to, to evaluate the realization of uh, those uh, objectives? It's a great question. Talking about measurement and evaluation of research is always challenging because unlike if we run a training for people where you can say after the training 25 people were trained, measuring the impact of research, it, it can be years before you see the effect. Um, so acknowledging that it is incredibly difficult to measure the outcomes of research and the effectiveness, uh, the, the what we're using for a proxy is that we would uh, give uh, questionnaires and, uh, and query our stakeholders if the findings were useful for them. We would continue to monitor uh, NGO activities in any reports or policy reports that seem to integrate our findings and also uh, in terms of the sharing of the document, uh, accessing to the website, we would run Google Analytics on our website and uh, monitor using Topsy and TweetReach and those sort of tools to see the amount of sharing. Certainly, does sharing mean that we're seeing change? Not necessarily, but given that uh, it's hard to measure the short-term impact of research, it's the best we can do, given that. Um, I would like to ask, uh, if you assume that the research is, is, is conducted, what is the reality? And coming from the first morning session, which was quite uh, ended on a quite intensified note, and having your colleagues staying outside of this building, my question would be, if, if this research is published, um, what are the possibilities of the local um, women rights organizations to use this report to push for their a advocacy effort realistically? I mean, what we are talking about here, uh, and I'm interested in the stakeholders based in Azerbaijan yeah. struggling for their rights. Yeah. I, this, is, this is really a concern for us as well. Um, I, we have um, deep concerns for research, research team members, um, and for research assistance. Their, their safety is the most important thing to us. Um, thankfully, our two Azerbaijani team members happen to hold uh, passports to other countries, which allows them a uh, much higher degree of safety. Also, because they've worked as activists for years, they know what they're getting into. In terms of uh, organizations that would partner with us in country, um, I think this morning is an excellent example, uh, for those of you that weren't there. The report that they published this morning uh, contained a great deal of our work, um, just as evidence that organizations here aren't afraid to work with us. Uh, granted, those are organizations that work in, in internet issues, but uh, thankfully, uh, with our team members especially, having so much long-term credibility, uh, they have expressed to potential partner organizations that uh, we're not uh, the purest driven snow to work with. Yeah. Um, also, I just want to add that the nature of this particular project is far less political than the kind of things that may be keeping our um, research associates from accessing the building or what Hadija just said this morning. This is a study of um, gender disparity and gender equality online, which I don't think has the kind of political ramifications that you know perhaps are being um, interpreted. I think actually it might interest um, people, government members in Azerbaijan, because this is a, this is a problem affecting 50% of their population. What direction things go in after um, you know, is a different story, but in terms of just um, you know, eliminating that gender disparity in access, I, I think that's something almost everybody would agree is a, a beneficial proposition for Azerbaijan, and in terms of um, you know, the applicability to the study elsewhere, it's, it's beneficial for the world. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that concludes uh, all the questions from the judging panel. Uh, no, no. No. So yes, thank you very much, Katie. Thank you very much, Sarah.
maybe you can join me in giving our presenters one more round of applause. They did an excellent job, and I just really want to thank them. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> in fact, they did so well sticking to our time constraints. We've um, ended an hour early. And rather than concluding so far in advance, and since we actually have uh, the, the bounty of having Sonia Kelly, who is the managing director of the Freedom on the Net report, and we also had several audience members come in uh, a little bit late, what we're going to do is invite all of the presenters to come back up to the front and sit in um, a panel of chairs that we're going to set up. And we're going to invite the audience to ask your questions. So we'll just go for another you know, 20 minutes if the questions sustain it. So we'll still end a little bit early and we can go see the flag raising ceremony and of course uh, go off to the wonderful receptions that are being held tonight. Um, but again, Sonia, if you'll uh, grace us with your presence up here and help us see the kind of um, global trends that all of these presentations highlighted and that you saw. Gigi, can you just provide information um, when, why, and uh, we will publish the winners and, you know, before we continue, sure. please. Sure. Well, as you know, today is the, the pre-event day and we have four more days of actual IGF sessions ahead of us. So uh, to keep you on your toes and the edge of your seat, we're going to hold the announcement of the winners until November 10th, which is Saturday. Um, the Freedom House delegation is actually having a wrap-up session to discuss uh, post engagement strategies for uh, continued advocacy around internet governance issues at the local, regional level. And that's when we'll have um, a small ceremony to acknowledge them. Anyone's welcome to come. We'll be at the Atropat Hotel. But we'll uh, make the announcement through uh, a press release and, and social media uh, announcements. I don't know if, Danila, you had anything you wanted to add to that. Um, OK. And the US ambassador in Azerbaijan will be uh, uh announcing the winners so right so yeah. luckily um, ambassador Richard Morningstar agreed to to come and make that announcement which will be very special um, but we would love to have you know a big audience there thanks well thank you very much Gigi for this uh, I'm going Did to you want to sit up front or uh, I okay. think this is all right okay great so you guys will be in the hot seat and Sonia will look at you from I would like to thank Gigi and my colleagues here for organizing a very interesting and interactive event. Uh, I know that I was quite inspired by several proposals, or for that fact, with all of the proposals and their ability to really make difference in their countries. Uh, I think all of the presentations that we've heard today reflect uh, also the findings of Freedom House's study uh, that was recently released uh, on uh, internet freedom and uh, one of the things that we showcased is that threats to internet freedom are increasing and becoming more, more diverse. Considering that we have heard uh, very interesting things from uh, our colleagues, uh, I would like to also use this opportunity to open up uh, the panel to questions from the audience. Uh, for example, if there is anything that you would like to ask either about the projects or about the situations in the countries in which our panelists live or work, uh, this would be a great opportunity. Uh, to start up the discussion, I would like to ask each of the panelists if you could tell me what are the top two threats to internet freedom in your country of interest and what do you think the international community could do to help address that problem? Uh, I'm not going to pick uh, anyone uh, at the outset. So is there someone who would like to start and then uh, we can move on? Go ahead, Anas. Physical security for, uh, sorry, physical security of the people who are using the net or activists online. This is like number one. And like limitation of access to some certain inf uh, important websites, like I'm not sure if you know that all the media, everything that media on Wikipedia is blocked in Syria. So you cannot see any of the pictures if you're browsing without proxy or whatever. Thank you. 
in that case, we'll continue with the order here. Yeah, in my country, South Sudan, one is the high pricing of licensing internet providers. That's one of the threats. The second is now the government is turning against internet freedom activists. These are the really two top threats, which have a lot of implications, if I were to explain further. Um, in my country, I think the problem is the new administration. Okay. Hello? Okay. It's okay? Okay. In my country, in Egypt, I think the problem is the new administration um, ideological group, they are not believe in freedom. Maybe they promote that for Western countries, but they don't believe in that. In the fu near future, I think after uh, our uh, constitution will develop and the new laws, I think they will block a lot of websites and uh, will attack us. Um, uh, this okay. Uh, well, from my country, the greatest problem is government hacking. Government hacking in our uh, databases and our conversations on, on online and surveillance and character assassinating. Uh, what I didn't mention in my presentation is uh, sometimes government goes ahead and uh, acts in its own websites and then claims that the uh, sexual minorities are acting our websites. A uh, case in Saturday we had a beach pride uh, in August this year where it happened to be the face of pride. So what government did, they got my picture when you're marching at the beach and they posted the Prime Minister's, Prime Minister's website uh, that gave one their rights. Then they wanted to bring a, a, a charge on us that we're hacking their website, uh, uh, you know, to demand for our rights. But then it was investigated, and somehow it just disappeared. They never mentioned anything more since that day. Um, for uh, Myanmar, the, the the biggest threat would be the um, the uh, legislation itself because. Um, it it really threatens internet freedom. For example, we have an electronic ad that that could sue a person um, to five year sentence if we had a laptop with a connection to the internet. So um, we need to um, review all those um, legislation. And then another threat would be the accessibility because um, the um, the penetration rate is already very low in our country. Um, and of course, digital illiteracy would, would be also one of the factors. My project is global, but I would like to speak about mm, a specific case of uh, Poland and European Union. So what I'm uh, afraid the most is the um, bad law, bad legislation. Uh, because a few years ago, governments uh, didn't care about internet, the politicians didn't understand the, 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 the role of internet. They didn't understand uh, what is this tool for. Now they, they understand that th this is a very powerful tool and I am afraid that even in our Western, uh, Western uh, society, in the well-developed countries, uh, we can have uh, more and more uh, problems with uh, people which have a power to, to control, to control, I mean, I mean, my afraid is about governments, about corporations. Um, I think the greatest threat is uh, state surveillance and in intimidation, um, which leads to people being afraid and to people censoring themselves. Um, Azerbaijan technically has a free internet, but a free internet is of very little use to people who are not free. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, it seems like that we have a variety of problems here, uh, ranging from uh, access to new legislation that restricts internet freedom uh, to practices by governments uh, such as surveillance. Uh, I did notice this aspect of new legislations uh, emerging in several of your presentations and then also in our research. Uh, so one of the projects, at least uh, the project on South, South Sudan, is actually proposing to, uh, to fight for new and better laws because there is particularly now a special opening in a new country such as South Sudan. So I think there is definitely a window of opportunity there. I do have one question before I open it to the audience, and it is specifically about South Sudan. Uh, I think the project that you're proposing is extremely valuable, and it really has huge, huge potential. At the same time, to be honest, one thing that really struck me was $15,000 is a not a lot of money, and you're really proposing to influence major legislation. How realistic is that? 
Uh, in the side of South Sudan, one of the things is that I don't think money is the source of influence or money is the power to influence decision. These 15,000, we're not going to use only 15,000, but we have our own connections as an organization. One, there's a big presence of diplomatic mission in South Sudan. We're going to use their presence. And secondly, we are engaged with EU human rights facility. So if we can secure these 15,000, we can knock those of others that already from Freedom House, we have secured this amount of money and place we need more to go beyond the level of 15,000. That is one. Secondly, Adam Smith International is a firm which we have worked with them and they're now being contracted to build our national security policy. And we, are, we, we have direct connection. So if we fail in the constitution process, we can attack in the national security bill. If we fail the national security bill, we can sort it out in the media bill. So we have a lot of options that this 15,000 can help us. So the only thing is now, how wise are we in using this 15,000? So for me, I didn't believe that money is a source of making a change. It's a commitment of us as an organization with a little to make a change. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask the audience, are there any questions that you would like to ask our panelists? Please raise your hand. Uh, let's thar start with Alexi here. May I ask two questions? <laughs> Uh, the first one is regarding Syrian project. Uh, as far as I uh, understand uh, your presentation, you plan to have a uh, few VPN servers, and it means you will have a limited set of IP addresses. So for government, it should not be a big problem to block them all. How will you deal with this problem? Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, it's uh, it's in the plan that we have some uh, Dyn DNS that we can always change the, I the IP addresses. Also, there are some specific ways of encrypting uh, the traffic. I can share this technical information, but it will be very bit hard to just like discuss it uh, in public. So, I, I can provide you with that later if you want. Uh, what was the other question? Uh, not for me, or for someone else? Thank you. Second question is not for you. Second is uh, regarding uh, Uganda project. Uh, do you think that uh, gathering all minority people in one place to, to make them secure is a bit insecure? I mean, if you single out the group of uh, people who are on the street, it it's makes them more visible. It's uh, easier to attack them. How how think you, you should deal with this problem? Uh, apparently, the, the problem has been with holding meetings in public places, say like known hotels, and uh, in guest houses. But now we are we having an approach of meeting six participants uh, for three days every week in their secure places. Uh, this organization will be shut down long time, but because government doesn't know where these organizations are, as I said, they are in a mix of uh, residential places, residential houses, I think it's going to be secure because these are already there secure you know, places where government does not know, and that's why we want to take the trainings. Instead of going to public, where government can ca just come and you know, land on us in a, in a uh, even big number. I will use my role of the moderator to actually ask one follow-up question for the colleague from Uganda. Uh, so, what would happen if the government actually caught you doing this training? Uh, uh, because there is no care legislation uh, uh, pertaining uh, people assembling, uh, what happens when they land on us, uh, they just close down the workshop and maybe uh, they arrest uh, the organizers, but this is just for a few days to take statements, but they don't arrest uh, participants. What they do is to support the trainings and maybe to stop their trainings where they, they don't do a race uh, to participants. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, any other questions from the audience? 
Um, let's see. Uh, as the audience is thinking of uh, additional interesting things, let me ask Lukasz for, from Poland. Um, I found your game very interesting and quite frankly something that I would love to play myself. But it sounded like uh, that your tra target audience are actually school children and that you wanted to distribute the game uh, to schools. I'm curious uh, in terms of the difficulty of doing that. I mean, in most of the countries, actually school curriculums are quite regulated. So uh, to which extent would you be able to actually distribute this in schools? Because, uh, because the, the game will be will be posted online on the on the uh, on the internet uh, the main thing is to is to get to the to the people to the to the students with the information with the information they they they, they can find the the, the game then that they can find campaign uh, on on on, so on so cl clicking on the link so so um, as I said, it will be different steps of engagement of schools. So, uh, so, so, so the really, really first step is uh, is uh, as I uh, uh, as I can imagine a teacher who 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 talks uh, even uh, in the last minutes of classes about the about the campaign and and provide the link. It's it's quite enough for the beginning, but uh, but we will provide uh, another this uh, so-called uh, edu kit uh, pack for pack of informations uh, for the for the teachers, so they can provide to the people a uh, survey, and uh, and 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 it will be another 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 mm, actions. Uh, proposal for for the teachers uh, that's why mm, yeah I think I think it is it is uh, possible to to reach uh, to catch the audience of the of the pupils and not only uh, pupils because I I didn't uh, di didn't uh, have a time to talk that uh, uh, at the same time we'll have this uh, school program our PR coordinator will be will be try to catch the audience of the internet users using some viral uh, viral uh, campaign uh, in uh, social networks because I really hope that it will be attractive attractive not only for pupils not only for the young uh, if if it will be attractive for the young uh, young people uh, it will be attractive also for adults I think uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleague from Egypt here. When uh, Freedom House evaluated internet freedom in Egypt, um, and we have been doing that for several years now, uh, we have noticed a very interesting uh, trend. So uh, during the Mubarak era, internet was uh, ranked as partly free. Yet when the regime change happened and when SCAF came to power, it seemed that certain things uh, were actually getting worse. So more bloggers were imprisoned, they were tried in military trials, uh, some people were, uh, were, uh, uh, were attacked, and uh, uh, quite worrisome things uh, were actually recorded in our research. Uh, our research actually ended uh, its coverage period in May, so everything that happened after May will be actually published next year. So I was wondering if you could update us in on the situation since the presidential elections and uh, what has happened after May and whether your outlook is more positive or more negative. Thanks. Um, the problem is in our country now, um, the Muslim Brotherhood is taking charge of the country and they they play the game of Mubarak but in another way that they have they try to promote that they are uh, with freedom of expression with the freedom of internet and uh, and uh, didn't they change anything just just talking and the other thing is added is Muslim Brotherhood uh, people n not not in the government I mean I mean uh, in the street there is a lot of groups now they try to attack internet activists uh, uh, through a lot of things uh, till they try to make trouble for him or to to make um, uh, like um, a case in the court against him it's not government it's not uh, the president it, it's only normal people not only muslim brotherhood but only also salafis is try to do the same 
But now if you if you write your your, your idea online uh, during Mubarak, I'm afraid from national security. Uh, but now I'm afraid from national security, uh, Muslim Brotherhood groups, Salafis. And I'm not afraid only to go to the jail. I'm afraid that they can uh, hurt me or my family. F um, and I think these are a lot of examples. Maybe I can support you by, by sending you a lot of uh, uh, links to support the next report. But it's a public. Yani it's, it's online. A lot of people are afraid like me. Thank you very much. Do we have, we have a question from audience? Thank you. Um, I'm called Lilian Naroga. I come from Uganda. Uh, mine is not a question, or it's just uh, more of a comment and uh, some sort of support to my brother in Southern Sudan. I work for the Collaboration International ICT Policy in Eastern Southern Africa. And I think there was a question that was raised on the issue of uh, the 15,000 being uh, you know, money that may not be enough to fund the project. From a policy, I'm a policy researcher and ICT policy researcher, and to me, I think the 15,000 is quite a lot. It, it can do beyond that because with a country as new as Southern Sudan, a lot is happening and no one is documenting what is happening there. So to have someone from South Sudan come here and uh, represent their country and be able to go into a field, an area that has not been experimented or researched on to me, it's a great idea and I fully support it. And just to let you know that we at CIPESA, we do have your, your, your back. Even if you don't win this project, you can always come to us and we work together. Thank you. Well, we definitely appreciate the wide support that the projects are getting here. Um, one thing that really uh, was interesting for me was uh, when another panelist uh, asked our colleague from South Sudan about internet penetration rates, and I remember you said something around 50%. Uh, I tried to look it up, and uh, because uh, th quite frankly the numbers seemed high, and I was not able to find that information in part because not even such basic data as internet penetration is available for a new country such as South Sudan. So I really want to highlight the importance of research uh, in a place like South Sudan in order for us to truly understand the extent of problems, not only when it comes to uh, legislative aspects, but then even most basic uh, uh, aspects of internet governance, infra internet infrastructure, and so on. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Would you be able to discuss issues whether that be the internet governance and particularly freedom of expression on the internet, which is a huge problem in your country. Thank you for the question. And um, for us, we have been um, organizing such events since um, like 2007. And, um, and for, uh, for example, um, to um, how, how freely we can uh, um, uh, we can address the issue. I would like to give an example of the uh, bar camp that we had done since 2010. Um, bar camp, bar camp is a sort of an unconference where um, where um, sections um, sections are not pre-registered. So it's it's like um, it's it's very open, and uh, people can discuss um, about um, about the things they want. So in 2010, while our um, um, our government isn't opening uh, opening yet, we managed to um, have a bar camp with um, with topics um, variety of topics coming like um, um, internet circumventions, um, internet um, um, uh, freedom of expression online. We have we have. Uh, Discussed on topics like like that since 2010. So now it's uh, now it's opening up. I think we can uh, s speak up more and voice up more. Um, so I think um, the for at the forum, um, I um, I believe that it will be very open and free. 
Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask uh, Sarah here, who studies Azerbaijan closely. Obviously, uh, Azerbaijan is hosting this IGF, and there has been so much controversy about this decision to hold it in a country that has uh, such strong authoritarian tendencies and that ranks only as partly free in Freedom House's surveys. Uh, I'm curious about your opinion. Do you think that uh, the fact that IGF is taking place here, uh, do you think that it's going to help uh, internet freedom activists in the country? Or, uh, and do you think that this is going to actually highlight some of the abuses that happen, particularly when it comes to arrests of bloggers and journalists? Or do you think that uh, not much is going to change and in fact that IGF is just going to increase the profile in the country and provide additional legitimacy to the government? Um, I don't think it's going to, is this on? Is this on? Uh, I don't think it's going to provide additional legitimacy to the government. However, I think you bring up a really important point, which is that while it might highlight um, authoritan authoritarian tendencies and practices right now when it's in the spotlight because of IGF, this is often forgotten. And we saw this earlier in the year with Eurovision. So I think that um, you know one of the opportunities we have here is to continue the coverage of Azerbaijan's human rights violations and political practices well after IGF has ended. So you know I'd like to see IGF as kind of uh, another start starting point um, for a conversation that can, should continue over time. Thank you very much. Do we have any additional questions from the audience? Um, if not, uh, I'm going to ask my final concluding question and I'm going to uh, pose it to Anas from Syria. Uh, could you give us the most recent update on the situation in Syria, particularly when it comes to the internet? Uh, when our researchers uh, did their work in Syria trying to assess the latest internet freedom uh, issues there, uh, they faced quite a few difficulties, both in research, but then also in some of the most basic things, like being able to actually access the internet, let, let alone think about you know, censorship things because of the precarious situation in the country. Actually, there are some more important problems for some areas that they don't have even electricity for days. So internet it is would be like the last thing that they would think about. They need necessities like bread and food. So for the details of the internet, I don't know about like all, all around because I don't know exactly what is happening all the time. But I can just only relate that uh, many, many people are like, when they go into like the pr uh, when they are arrested now the government is like trying to get more information before they n the, the others know that they are arrested because they will even get more information from whatever facebook pages they are part on uh, part of whatever contacts they've made with others but if you want like details like that i'm sorry i don't have uh, much information about that all right, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to express again my gratitude to all of the panelists and uh, all of the competitors in this challenge. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm personally very impressed with all of their proposals and uh, regardless of whether they get an award from Freedom House, I hope that at least some people in the audience uh, will talk to them and hopefully uh, their presentations will spur additional conversations and, and potentially additional funding as well. Uh, I'm going to turn over microphone to my colleague Gigi if she's here in the room. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to ask you to give applause uh, to all of our participants. So I get to share the happy news that everyone gets to go home. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming. If you have you know, further questions, I'm really glad we have the next four days to uh, spend time together and get to know each other. And of course, um, that was fantastic to have someone step forward and say, you know, um, of course we can only award, you know, at least two uh, grants, and so we'll have some other presenters who could have, you know, fantastic conversations with you about maybe how you could fund them um, I with this project or future ones. And uh, we're always here to to support them. Thank you very much. <laughs>